Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Welcome to my channel if this is your first time here. My name is Megan and I am the witch here around the cauldron. Today's YouTube video is going to be the same as today's podcast episode because I feel like it can fit in both. And I'm going to be doing a Q&A style video. I haven't done a Q&A in a while and I felt like it was about time I did another one. So I asked on Instagram, I asked here on YouTube and in my forum and on Spells8 for your questions. And I gathered, I think I, think I have nine questions and I'm just gonna go through and answer them and talk about whatever the answer is. So question one says, how long did it take you to master tarot? Did you memorize the meanings or use intuition? <laughs> I don't think I have mastered tarot. I go back and forth between being really good at it and then sometimes I don't feel connected to my intuition at all and reading tarot is a struggle for me. But I've been reading tarot since I was 19, 20? That's over 10 years. And I still, to this day, find something new to learn about the cards. I think it was just last year I had this revelation about the Seven of Swords and how it's not always about betrayal or deception and um, taking things from people. And sometimes it's about having all of these things that you're doing that you have picked up from other people that you don't necessarily need to be holding on to yourself. You need to give some of that stuff back. But yeah, that's that's besides the point. The, the point is, one, I don't think I have mastered tarot. I don't think you can ever master tarot because it's something that is just a lifelong journey through both the meanings of the cards as well as with your intuition. And then the second part of the question is, did I memorize the meanings or use intuition? And I do a little bit of both. And it really depends on the deck that I'm using because... I I have trouble connecting with the Rider Waite style cards. Um, I think the only real deck that I have that is in that style that I connect with is my traditional manga tarot. And I think that's just because I like the art and I can pick up on the symbols and stuff a lot better in those cards than I can with the traditional um, Rider Waite deck that was drawn is not the right word the the it was the artist is pamela coleman smith we'll go with that um but yes more than 10 years i've been reading tarot i use a mixture of intuition and the meanings of cards it really just depends on how i'm feeling and what i'm getting during the reading i tend to use the meanings of the cards more when i'm reading for myself because Sometimes I'm too close to the situation. So what I'll do first is I will ask my question and I will pull the card, write down the meaning of the card and the symbols and any sort of feeling that I get from the card and I'll leave it alone and come back to it later. And this is, this is more helpful for me because then I don't have my own bias and put into the reading. Now, when I'm reading for other people, it definitely is a lot of intuition mixed with the meaning of the card. And I think that that just comes with practice and reading for other people. You just, you just have to practice. Question two says, what do I think about being a witch online versus a witch in the local community? It's easy these days to find magical spaces and fellow magic lovers on the web, but much harder to find witchy spaces in person. How have you personally worked with that divide and what do you think about any local or nearby witchy places you've come across? So I have a confession to make. I am not really part of any specific local witchy community. I, I have a hard time making friends. I have a hard time finding where I fit in friend groups and I haven't really found honestly I haven't even really searched for a witch specific or pagan specific group of people to hang out with or do ritual with or things like that it's honestly not really something I'm interested in because I prefer my friend groups my friend group to have more in common than just witchcraft and paganism because 
then that's all you end up talking about. And I think that it's better to have a well-rounded group of friends who, you know, you have more interests and more things to do rather than just talking about your religion or your spiritual practice. Now, with that being said, <laughs> I have found surprisingly here in Florida that the people that I gravitate to outside of a witchcraft specific search, I guess, tend to be more witchy or tend to be more spiritual or pagan. And it's funny that it worked like that because even when I lived in Oregon, um, you know, I, I didn't get out much. We lived in a small town and I was always working and you know, we just, we spent time together as a family and we went and did things like that. I didn't really have any in-person friends when I lived in Oregon. And honestly, I haven't really had in-person friends since I lived in California. And I think that's just because that's where I'm from. That's where I grew up. The friends I made there are friends that I went to school with. And some of them I still talk to today. But here, it's different. And I credit a lot of that, honestly, to homeschooling my child because if I wasn't homeschooling my child, we wouldn't go out and find homeschool groups. We wouldn't go do these field trips and these activities with these other parents and children. And it just so happens that the group that I got involved with is all about inclusivity, 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 diversity, all kinds of things like that. And many of them are witchy or witch adjacent or spiritual themselves. So that just sort of happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I do think it can be difficult to find people in person that you sort of vibe with. And it's, it's harder to interact with people in person, in my experience. Because when you're online, you can come and go as you please. And if you find a group that turns out to be not so great, you can just like slowly back away leave the group and be done with it. And that's a little more difficult to do in person. But when you do find those people in person, the experiences are just so much better, I think. And it's nice to have people either in person or online that you can talk to about the spell work that you're doing or the divination or the deities or gods that you're worshiping or talking to or petitioning without having people look at you like you're crazy. Been there, done that. Um, it's not so fun. But I think like the extent of my in-person witchy experience is just that. We just kind of gravitated together and now we're all friends. <laughs> the next question says, what is polytheism and why do you believe it? So polytheism, I, I have a whole video on polytheism, hard polytheism versus soft polytheism. So I will leave that in the description and in the show notes for podcast listeners. But very briefly, polytheism is the belief in or worship of more than one deity, more than one god or goddess. And like that's the most simple definition that I could give to you. Why do I believe in polytheism? I think that's a bit more complicated because for me, it's just something that feels right. It feels like the right answer. Uh, there's so much in the world, so many different cultures and belief systems and types of people, so much disaster and natural connection that I can't just believe in one God. It just, it doesn't work for me. I, I don't find that that fits in with my worldview, I guess. But also, I can't just believe in no gods. That has not been my personal experience with spirituality and divinity. I have had experiences where it's just like, oh my goodness, this is a legit thing. These beings, these entities are here and they are real. I don't believe my gods are real. I know my gods are real. It's up to other people to believe in it or not. But I know what my truth is and polytheism just fits with my truth. 
The next question says, what does witchcraft mean to you? <laughs> and I've never thought about this question. Not until, um, not until I was asked, actually. Because it's just something that I've been doing for so long that it's just here. It just is for me. It's part of my day, part of my life. But remembering back to when I was a young teen, when I first found Wicca, I was going through some stuff. It's like stuff that I'm not even going to talk about here because it's just too much. And Wicca, I think, it felt like a way for me to take back control of the life that I was living. It felt like, like I could drive my own life. I could choose the direction that I was going in. Because as a 12 or 13 year old, with all this stuff happening, like it feels very much out of control. And that's hard, that's hard for anybody. But I mean, I it was especially hard as a young teen going through whatever life was throwing at me, but also going through like puberty and and dealing with being bullied and things like that it very much was a way for me to connect back with myself and my inner power. Now, it's still kind of the same. I, it is still a way for me to connect with myself. I do some, I do a lot more self-reflection and more work on my home and my family than I did when I was a teen. But it's also a way for me to help the community because I do community healing. I do community energy work. I do community divination. And it's, it's very much, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's my power, it's my connection, but it's also my community service. I, I'll leave it at that. The next question says, how do you know an online or in-person group is right for you and not just intuition? And I think I could probably do an entire video on this, how to tell if a group is right for you, what are some red flags to watch out for, and things like that. But I think outside of intuition, there are a few things that you really want to pay attention to. Um, the first, if you're new to the group, how do the group members approach you? How do they treat you? Are they friendly? Are they standoffish? Do they just kind of ignore you? Is there a hierarchy to the group? You know, is there a leader? Are there, if you're talking about a coven, is there a priest and a priestess? And how do they approach the group? Or is it a sort of democracy? Everybody gets together and everybody talks. Um, everybody has their, their time to share their thoughts and opinions. And when it comes to sharing thoughts and opinions, is everyone given the chance to speak? Is everyone given free reign to say what they think and what they feel. I think that's extremely important. If I'm in a group, if I'm in a group setting and everybody is talking and everyone is sharing their thoughts and opinions and I try to speak and then I can't, or I feel like I can't share my thoughts and opinions, I immediately like shut down and I wanna leave. I don't wanna be part of a group that doesn't wanna hear what I have to say too. If we're all listening to each other, then, you know, I deserve to be listened to as well, right? You also want to watch for dog whistles, things like um, folkism and racism and fascism and transphobia and things like that. And sometimes it's not presented blatantly. Actually, most of the time, it's not outright, I'm a racist, outright, I'm transphobic. It is subtle. Those could be hard to catch if you don't know what you're looking for. So really paying attention to what people are saying and how they're saying it as well. And then a personal one for me would be accommodations. So do they accommodate for any disability that someone might have? Do they accommodate for uh, children? In, in uh, my case, I have a child and she likes to go with me to most places. Any place that, or any group online, well online, bringing in kid doesn't matter. But in person, any place that I don't feel safe or I don't feel welcome and included, 
in an accessible way for me is not a place that I want to go. So I hope all of that really answers that question. I'm going to add this to my list of video topics and in the future I will do an entire video on how to know if a group is right for you or not. The next question says, I'm curious if your parents automatically accepted that you were into witchcraft and paganism or if it grew on them, as your last video contained items that your parents bought for you for your craft. Okay, so the video that they're talking about is my consecration video, I believe. I believe. I will leave a link to that in the description and in the show notes for anyone that wants to see what those are. Um, but as for the question, <laughs> no. <laughs> My parents were not automatically accepting of me being interested in witchcraft and paganism. But I mean, it was the early 2000s by the time I found Wicca and my parents didn't know anything about it. Nobody's parents really knew anything about it. And my parents grew up in religious households. I didn't grow up in a religious household. It was just sort of like we kind of believe in God, maybe. But I remember telling my mom that I wanted to be Wiccan, that I wanted to practice witchcraft and be Wiccan with this religion. And she very much was like, um, no, that's not, that's not okay. That's devil worship. That's satanic. The usual stuff that you would imagine a semi-religious person would think. So in my early teens, I learned all I could through books and whatever websites I could find, but I didn't practice really much at all because I wasn't allowed to. And it's hard to practice something when you're not allowed to and you don't have the tools and stuff at your disposal to really do anything. Um, but over time, you know, my parents have seen that this is not something that's going away and this is a belief that I hold. And they're... They're way, way more accepting now than they were to begin with. And it was never something that was like, oh my God, no, you can't do that. That's terrible. It was more of a like, no, we're, we're not going to do that. Not, not in my house, not right now sort of thing. But I think they see how important my beliefs are to me, how important my faith is to me. And that has changed their opinion. I have done rituals with my mom like little spells with the bay leaf and wishes for the new year and things like that. And she has actively gotten involved. I have given my dad my um, broad breeze, the shawl that I set out on Imolk for Bridget to bless with healing um, whenever he is experiencing any pain. And my dad's funny. He's just like, oh, I don't want that. That's what is the point of this? And like, I'm just like, just humor me. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, then I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but um, my mom, my mom is the one that is the most open to it out of my parents. And uh, we have talked about tarot and I've shown her my tarot cards and I've done readings for my Nana. Um, and yeah, so no, they weren't always accepting, but... They kind of are now and they kind of, not kind of are, they are now and they just realize that it's just who I am. This is how it's going to be, whether they like it or not. So they might as well like it, I guess. <laughs> okay, three more questions left. The next question says, do you have an oh my god magic or the gods are real moment that you are willing to share? <sighs> Honestly, every time a spell works for me, I am immediately like, oh my gosh this is real. I always have a healthy dose of skepticism, I guess. And I know what I do works, but sometimes it's still a shock. It's still a surprise that something that I did with my own power and my own practice had physical change or emotional change or whatever I was doing. And it never fails to surprise me <laughs> that every Thursday, when I work my prosperity altar, within the next several days, I get unexpected money. And this is in the form of tips for tarot readings, or a shop order, or ad revenue, or something unexpected. New members in my um, membership, 
whatever it is. And I'm always just like, oh, yeah, this works. <laughs> and I don't know how many times it's going to have to work for my fiance to be like, oh, hey, this does work because he's always just like, oh, it's just a coincidence. Because if you listen to my last podcast episode, he's very agnostic. He is just like, oh, I don't believe in that stuff, but you do you. And then any sort of interaction that I have with the gods is... <sighs> I'm trying to think of one specific one where I was just like, okay, yes, this is a thing. And the one that comes to my mind most recently, I believe it was last year, I was having some mechanical trouble with my vehicle and I was like, I don't know what to do the warranty I don't know if the warranty is going to cover this I don't know what the shop is saying like they've had my vehicle for a week and what the heck is going on so I sat down and I petitioned Bridget and I gave her offerings and I made her a deal I was like you know what if you help me with this and I get my vehicle back fixed safe and I don't have to pay anything out of pocket and everything is covered I will do this for you and um, you know I, I sat with a candle and I gave her the petition and I meditated and just said what I needed to say and if you wouldn't know it the very next day the shop calls me and they say hey we know what's wrong we're gonna fix it and it's gonna be free and then you're gonna get your car back in like three days once we're done with it and I was like thank you very much Bridget like holy crap and I didn't make the connection with Bridget and vehicles until later when it's like Bridget is connected with blacksmithing and forging and engineering and the mechanics of how things work and so I was naturally drawn to petition her not just because she's the deity that I work with the most but because of her connection with modern machinery but yeah that <laughs> It still blows my mind to this day that that's how that happened. And then I made good on my deal and gave Bridget what I promised. Uh, the next question says, are there any fellow witchy YouTubers or authors that have made you go, oh, that's what that is, or similar reaction to any of their content? Um, I don't know if I've had a reaction like that, but I have had reactions where I'm just like, oh, duh, of course I can do that. <laughs> or learning something new about whatever. Um, Ivy the Occultist here on YouTube, I learned about planetary grids and using those to create sigils. Um, just recently, I read the book Metal Magic by uh, Sam Bo Thompson. I think it's Thompson. Um, and it didn't dawn on me until reading the book that I crochet and all of my hooks are metal. Like, duh, of course I could work with the metal of my crochet hooks for this work. Because it's work as in I make things to sell, but also it's work as in I do it as a devotional practice. It's metal! Like, why wouldn't I have made that connection before? And there have been so many times like that. I highly recommend for anybody who is interested in anything with the occult or witchcraft or spirituality or paganism to find as many sources as you can, as many people to listen to their experiences. Because while it may not be academic, I think in our community, anecdotal evidence is just as important as academic evidence. And I'm constantly learning from the other people that I interact with, um, even you, my audience. I am constantly learning from you as well. So yes, those are, those are the two that come to my mind that happened most recently. And the last question says, just for fun, if you could go on a platonic witchy date with any YouTube witch, who would it be and where would you go and what would you do? And so I've been thinking about this question ever since I saw it because I can't choose. What I would rather do, and I know this isn't like exactly an answer to your question, but what I would rather do is have everybody that wants to come get together at the park and hang out and have like a potluck or like bring your favorite food and just, just hang out and experience being with each other in that sort of way. 
I guess, where you can get together with people that are similar to you and talk and learn from each other and maybe swap books or spell ideas or crafts, you know, have like a crafting, I want to say secret Santa, but like, like that. And I think that's what I would rather do than just pick one person because I can't pick one person. There are so many great people out here on the internet, on YouTube, so many great authors and people with podcasts and other creators that it's impossible to pick just one. And so I'm not going to. I pick everybody that wants to be included for my made up <laughs> picnic at the park. Well, that's what I would do. So if that ever happens, then I will make sure to invite everybody that wants to come. Will it ever happen? I have no idea. <laughs> Right now, I don't recommend coming to Florida at all. <laughs> and that's it. Those are all of the questions that I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this episode, this video, and sort of getting a peek inside of my brain in the way that I think, I suppose. Um, and my past experiences, because I feel like my past experiences could be helpful to someone else. And if it is, then that's awesome. And I am doing what I set out to do here. The reason that I created my YouTube channel and my podcast was to help people. So if I help at least one person, then I am doing my job. So if you'd like to join a community of like-minded individuals and uh, talk to me and other people, check out my forum. I will leave the link for that in the description below. Follow me on social media. Um, again, all of my links will be in the description. Thank you so much to my members. If you would like to become a member and help support my work here and get early access plus some extra extra um, fun members only content, you can find that at roundthecauldron.com slash join me for as little as $2 a month. And that would mean so much to me. Um, I also opened up memberships here on YouTube for anyone watching on YouTube. You can find that at the join button, I think. I don't know how all of that works yet. I just barely opened it. And that's, that's gonna be it for today. And thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And I will talk to you next time.